a love and dedication to you, Lord, because we're here to glorify your name. We're here to learn from you so that we can spread your word to others. Bless us. Let your spirit guide us into understanding, especially this chapter, Lord, of Matthew 12, as we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. So you can turn your scriptures to Matthew chapter 12. In fact, I'd like to start with another verse. Okay, but you can open it there, of course. You know, when Yeshua intercepted Paul on the road to Damascus uh, and appeared through a a beaming light, brighter than the the sun, it says, as it is written, there there he he called them to salvation and then explained his new mission to the world. Right? So he spoke these powerful words. Look at Acts 26, 81. No, no, these are important. This is an important verse that I often uh, recall or remember, you know, because th- these are the words of, of, of Yeshua, of Jesus, you know, w- when it comes to the world uh, that we live in. 26, 18. Did I say 81? <laughs> 18, 26, 18. <laughs> Starts well. So this is what it says. Okay, so Jesus speaks to Paul and he says, Rise rise and stand on your feet and go open their eyes in order to turn them from where? To darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness. Okay, this ambiguous word divides the world into two distinct, very divergent entities. Okay, this is what we need to realize. Okay, darkness and light and more precisely, From the power of Satan to the power of God. This is how these two parallel uh, realities we live in, right? Okay, they are well defined for us. Okay, there's no middle point, is there? Because we saw this on Saturday, in fact. There's no middle point. And we need to realize this because people who do not know Yeshua, right, are in, uh, they are in darkness and under the power of Satan. This is what it says. This is why we need actually to pray and to exceed in the knowledge of the scriptures and in knowledge of, of our relationship with the Lord. Uh, and this is what is clearly brought out here in this chapter 12. It begins by showing us that distinction between the two parallel worlds that, that we actually uh, are going to see. And, and w- w- what this tells us also is that we're not spectators. Okay? Uh, only the angels are spectators, by the way. Okay, so what it says in, in, in okay. we are on the stage. Where we are there. Okay, not only that, we are in a battlefield. If you're in a battlefield and you don't wear your armor, then what happens? You fall. You fall. Okay. So this is why we need to put the armor. Okay. And here Jesus is going to make this distinction because. Here he's going to stress this partition by speaking of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. This is our, again in Matthew 12, you can go back there, are the words of Jesus. Okay, and we read that, look at 1230, chapter 30, it says, uh, uh, 1230. Chapter 12. We're going to chapter 12 in Matthew now. Okay, we're staying there. Okay. Uh, look, look how Jesus brings out this point. He says, He who is not with me is against me. Ah, but I thought Jesus, it was okay to go a little bit here and there. No, he says, When you're not with me, you're against me, he says. And he who does not gather with me scatters around. Okay, so there's no, it's like riding on a bicycle, right? Can you stop? You can't stop. If you stop, you fall. Okay, the bicycle, you need to go forward. But the bicycle never goes backward either. That's the life of a, of a believer. You need to go on this bicycle and you go forward. Otherwise, you fall, right? And, and the opponent, by this time in Matthew, his opponents actually understood very well this division. By the middle of chapter 12, after that Yeshua performed yet a great miracle. We're going to see that nobody performed that miracle before. This is what they said in verse 14. Look what... Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. That's it. They wanted to kill him. Right? When when there's no more argument, no more reason, justification, or rationalism, violence takes over. This is what we're going to see. All right? Just like Dostoevsky once wrote. He says, if God exists, everything is possible. If there's no God, everything is permitted. They wanted to kill, actually. God made flesh in here which is great. So this is the division where are so often we, we lose sight. Okay, this is why I wanted to, to start with the book of Acts, right? We lose sight of, we're very often reminded of this, especially through the 21 letters written specifically to the churches. 
that is the New Testament. This is our laws. This is what is, and we remember that every single letter that is written to the churches, okay, from Romans to Jude, you have a warning, a warning about false prophets, a warning about falling, and so on and so forth. So we need to put on the armor, right? And what do we need, of course, first, so that we may not be lured into uh, the, the church of Pergamum. Okay, Pergamum, you know, is married to the world because the world is calling us more and more. The world around calling us to do things with it and so on. We have to be strong enough to be part of the world, but not in the, that is part of it. In the world, but not part of it. That's the idea, right? In there, but not part of it. Okay. And there is another great aspect as we go to read chapter 12 up to chapter 28 of Matthew. Okay. Something that is very touching. And I want you to, to, to realize this. Okay. Is that while Yeshua was accused of the worst charges ever. Okay. He so gently and always defended himself. Look at his behavior. Right. He, he was still trying to convince even those who were slapping him. Okay. Perhaps that, that one lost soul okay, among the thousand okay, was there. So he speaks for that one soul. Okay. He did not get angry. Okay. At times he did, but most of the time he did not get angry. He, he's leaving us a perfect uh, example of power in humility. Power in humility. Okay. Is that my prayer that this part of the scriptures will get to know him better and will get to know also the distinction of the two worlds uh, we are living in, in here. By the way, another verse I want to bring to you. Look at verse 19 to 20. It speaks about Yeshua, you know, not uh, be, being under attack. He says, he will not quarrel, not cry out. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruise really will not break. Yet he had the power of judgment. He had the power. This is God incarnate. Yet he allowed everyone to uh, go against him. So keep your eyes closed on Jesus, not only in Matthew, but in life in general, right? It's easier. Let's read the first two verses of Matthew 12 okay as they say the stage for the argument brought against Yeshua okay so verse 1 and 2 at that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Shabbat and his disciples were hungry and began to plug heads of grain and to eat and when the Pharisees saw it they said to him look your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Shabbat okay this is the first time we hear of the Shabbat in Matthew, okay? Uh, the Shabbat was given to, to Israel as a memorial of God's power in creation, as a reminder of His mighty hand, especially in the book of Exodus. But the Shabbat, the Shabbat will not be the only time we read of in this gospel because this great day of rest was turned as a crushing monster against Jesus, okay? By, by the religious leaders. He is, and this is, an, what he did with the Shabbat is an example of the yoke of legalism yoke of legalism okay just in chapter 12 we encounter two arguments based on their understanding of the shabbat the first one is one when they accuse the disciple as we just read of working on the shabbat uh, for they were going through the grain of field eating the corns or whatever they were eating the second is when Yeshua healed the man with a withered hand, okay? They accused him of transgressing the Shabbat because he went and he did something good on the Shabbat, okay? But at the end, the Shabbat is only a means for them to attack the Messiah, okay? Uh, as we'll go further into their controversies and disputes, we'll see that uh, it will increasingly, they, they will increasingly become out of themselves, okay? At some point, it's going to be funny. Because if you fight against God, okay, you have no argument at the end. So you have to resort to either, the, uh, you know, violence and also silliness. Okay, because there's a part of Matthew that is actually very funny. Okay. So the disciples were accused of breaking the Shabbat. But which Shabbat were they referring to, the Pharisees? Which Shabbat? Okay. It's not the one that God gave. It's the one that they made up. Okay, even today you have to understand that rabbinical Judaism is not the same Shabbat as what the Bible says it is. They added, you know how many additional laws to the Bible? At least 1,500 of them. Okay, so that it's finished, you don't see it anymore. Okay, you, you don't see the scriptures. Okay, this is the problem we're going to see. Okay, is that the Pharisees at the time when Jesus came made their own religion. And so this is what Jesus says in John 5.46, If you knew Moses, you would know me. 
Okay, if you know the scriptures, you would come to me. They couldn't see him anymore. Why? Because they're not in the scriptures. We have to understand that because there is a, a tendency to go towards rabbinical Judaism today. People love that. They go there. Great. I, I love it too, by the way. You know, I come from there. It's traditional and so on. Okay, but let's not forget. It, there's a big distinction between what they teach and what the Bible teaches. Uh, th- this is where I personally made that, that, that break with rabbinical Judaism and I went into the scriptures which made me a fuller Jew we, <laughs> uh, what were the disciples accused of exactly Okay, and the disciples were hungry and began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat and when the Pharisees saw it they said look they're going into the Shabbat how is it unlawful how did they understand the Shabbat you know, we can divide the work of harvest into three divisions, okay? There's the reaping, the threshing, and the winnowing. The reaping is to cut the wheat with a sickle. This is what they used to do. God says, don't do that on the Shabbat. The threshing is to separate the seed from the harvested plants, okay? Don't do that on the Shabbat because, you know. And the winnowing is to remove the chaff in the current air because at some point, if you go into book of Ruth, you know, they, they, they had the, the winnowing, the threshing floor where they, they, they would wait for the wind to blow and then, okay, they would come and take out all the, the, uh, the, the impurities of, of the grain. This is what the rabbis, they said, the Mishnah, when the winnowing, the threshing floor had to be outside of the city, very far, so that it doesn't come back into the city, right? And see how the two Shabbats differ, okay? However, when these Pharisees saw it, the disciples began to pluck the, the heads of grain to eat, which is far from working in the field. However, according to them, by plugging, the, the disciples were, according to them, guilty of reaping. He said, you're reaping, but not with aiding, right? No, you're reaping, that's against the law. This is how legalism begins. You take one law, you make a big deal out of it. As they separated the wheat from the shaft, they were guilty of threshing. Oh, you're threshing. No, we're not working the field. Yes, you are working the field. You see? And, and then, because they didn't see anymore the, the human aspect of it. The human aspect, which says these guys were hungry. Okay. But wait, Jesus has a great answer. Then, then as they blew the, the shaft, they were guilty of winnowing. And, and perhaps, you know, when they were eating, they were guilty of storing the harvest as well. I don't know how far they would go. Okay. See, it, it, there's a distinction. By the way, this is a light example. Because the, the, the laws of the Shabbat went very far, even how to make your bed. Okay? You have to make it in certain ways so that you don't spend too much time into it and so on. Okay? There, there was, uh, because what happened is that the law put a screen between God and man. This is what it, their law, not the Mosaic law, okay? Now, I want you to see how Yeshua answers, okay? Uh, the creator of the Shabbat, the Lord of the Shabbat, gives them a sublime answer. What he says, by the way, what he says, you can just read it, it'll be fine, but he does require to rethink the Mosaic law, okay? Uh, his answer here demands that we, we stop and go back because they're really a revolutionary answers. Are you ready for it? Let's go. Verse three to five. Anybody would like to read it? <laughs> Somebody with a nice voice. Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> you know, I love. He brings them back to the word of God. Twice he tells them, "Have you not read?" Because if they knew the Bible, they wouldn't have this question. They wouldn't have said what they said. Okay? Because the Bible frees us. Okay? We will come back to these words, have you not read? Because, because they have not read, this is how, why Israel is the way it is today. Okay? This is a complaint of Jesus, even at the end. Right? So the first answer does not concern the Shabbat, okay? but the law itself. Okay, the second concerns the Shabbat specifically. So he starts with the law itself. So the, verse, the first one brings us to a situation with David, found in 1 Samuel 21. We don't need to go there. And the more, by the way, you read this story, the more you realize there's no better example to explain the law itself. Okay, so at the time, in, in, uh, in, I think it's 2 Samuel 21, not 1 Samuel. Oh, first time, yeah. Okay, David was pursued to be killed by the civil authorities. Okay, who was, who was pursuing him? Okay, it was King Saul. But really, this guy wasn't supposed to be a king because he wasn't from the tribe of Judah. So, but Saul came and he anointed David. Okay, yet the other one found out about it and he was pursuing David to kill him. This is why you have these beautiful psalms. Samuel. 
Samuel, that's right. What did I say? Samuel, no, Saul is not. Okay, Saul he was a tall guy, that was the bad guy. <laughs> so he's the one who was pursuing uh, David to kill him. Okay, and if you read the Psalms where, where David says, The Lord, you, you have left me, you know, I'm looking for you, it's because they were, there was the time when Saul and his army was running after him, you know, to, to kill him. Okay, and because, and, and so what happened uh, is that, by the way, do you find something uh, familiar already? They were running after David, the ancestor of the Messiah, to kill him when he was anointed. And here they're running after Jesus, who is the Messiah, to kill him. And the same civil authorities of Israel are there. Already we see a similarity. Jesus picked up the best answer for them. Okay. They, they, this is... Okay. So... Uh, Okay, so, so in the story of First Samuel, okay, David and his men were hungry, okay, so what they did, yes, tell me, David was hungry, so what he did, he went to the temple, and he asked the high priest, he says, I'm hungry, what do you got? So the, temp, the priest said, listen, I only have the, the breads, you know, that is the, the showbreads, okay, the showbreads that are in the temple, the holy of holies, nobody was supposed to eat them. Only the high priest. That was the law. That's the law. God said. And once a week. Every time they go after a week. Okay. And they change them. Okay. And they take the 12 breads. And the, the priest will eat them. Okay. And if you ask. How can they eat bread. That is old of one week. It was fresh. It was always fresh. It was to tell them. God was telling them. You know. I can make things fresh all the time. Okay. So nothing perished in the temple itself. Okay. Now the question that Jesus is asking the Pharisees. And, uh, and he's asking you too. How come David and his men ate the holy bread that was unlawful to eat, and yet it was acceptable by God? God wasn't angry about this. He broke the law. So how come? By the way, do you know where the showbread is? I have some. Uh, you, you, our service, okay, the service, the Holy Spirit is there. Then you have, of course, the altar of incense, which is prayer. And then you have the showbread, which represents uh, the provision, okay? Nobody was allowed to touch this. Yeah, the, he's also the manna, right? Nobody was. A, and yet, he ate it. How come? Okay, he's the bread. Okay, so in this argument, what Yeshua is saying is that even if what they were saying is right, his disciple was hungry in the same way as David and his people were hungry, and they ate something that was supposed to be unlawful, but it turns out to be lawful. Okay, that says a lot about the law. No? Okay. Here Yeshua is addressing the essence of the Mosaic law. The essence of the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law in its entirety was given for the welfare of man. Man, Shabbat was given for man. Okay, man wasn't created for the Shabbat. Because they idolized so much the Shabbat that it seems that we have to follow. No, you can actually, God changed things in order to uh, go to, to, to adapt with man. So the ceremonial laws were subject to reinterpretation for the welfare of man. This is what we learn here, yeah. Now he says, maybe you're right. Can you explain to me, David? This is his first argument in there. Okay, that's beautiful. A bit of the doubt, so to speak. He says, maybe you're right. How come it goes like this? Yeah, you wanted to say something? And the ambulance stops at the red light. Does it make sense to you? Why? That's the law. That's the law, right? No. The law was its change for the welfare of man. This is the idea with David. It was change for the welfare of man. We're talking about ceremonial laws. Because there are laws that you cannot change. You cannot kill. You cannot commit adultery and stuff like this. But these ceremonial laws were there. Even at some point in time, if you remember, I think God told Jeremiah, can you find somebody for me to close the door of the temples? It's enough. I can't hear anymore. The first chapter of Isaiah also. I can't hear. I can't accept your sacrifices and so on. We The law was added. It was added. It wasn't there since the beginning as it is taught in rabbinical Judaism that it was there uh, always in eternity. It was added. John, it's actually Galatians 3.19. It was added just like when I have kids who don't go to bed at a certain time, I make up a law. 
I added a lot because they're not reasonable. Okay? So because we're not reasonable, God made up these laws. Okay? Th- th- that's the idea of a law. Okay? Why do we have red light? Because we're not smart enough sometimes to stop at a red light because somebody might be coming or we might kill somebody else. Okay? That's the idea. But the next argument is more to the point. Now look at So now he gave the, the, the first thing. Now the second thing, he says... Okay, it says he directs them again to the temple and asks them to consider the priest on the Shabbat. Okay, and uh, Jesus purposely uses a strong word to describe the action of the priest on the Shabbat. In verse 5 he says, Or have you not read in the law that the Shabbat, the priest the te- uh, in the temple profane the Shabbat? Are the priests breaking the Shabbat on the temple? They are. Because they're sacrificing. You're not supposed to do that on the Shabbat. And he says, how come? How come then the priest for the priest that is allowable? Yet lately we, we spoke in fact to a Jew. And that person never uh, knew that uh, during the Shabbat the temple was still working. She says it's impossible. Yes, it's impossible. In fact, you have more sacrifices on the Shabbat than you have in other times. Okay, why is that? How can you explain this? Anybody? Yeah. The devil has no Shabbat. Okay? It's always there. Even, you know what? Even when you go on vacation, you think that Satan stays in Montreal? Okay? <laughs> take, <laughs> take, take, your, take your Bibles with you. This is what, what, when you take your Bible and, and stuff like this, right? And, and Jesus said it in John 5. Okay? When they asked him, they said, you work on the Shabbat? And Jesus says, me and my father, we work in the Shabbat. Me and my father. All, Jesus works 24 hours a day. To, that is seven days a week. You call them. Yes. In that sense. Okay? Yeah. In the temple. He's trying to bring them to see the essence of the law itself. Okay? That the law was made for man. Okay? And by the way, let me ask you something. What were the Pharisees doing in the uh, field, the grain field, after Jesus? They're not supposed to because the law says, the law in Exodus 16, that on the Shabbat you stay home. You're not supposed to get out of the house. Why were they following Jesus? Of course, they made up laws, okay, that you can go one kilometer away, you know, this is where people live next to a synagogue, okay, but I doubt there was a synagogue next to to a grain field, or maybe there was, or maybe I don't know what, you understand? So they themselves were breaking the law, okay, but let me throw you another curved ball. What was Jesus doing on the grain field? Was he breaking the law? (laughs) Ambulance. Because Jesus was going actually to heal somebody. Somebody. Somebody was in a synagogue. He went to heal. Not only was he going to heal somebody, he was going to heal the whole world. Okay? So he went through it. He walked through it. Okay? In that sense. Yeah. This has... We, we can think a lot about these things. There's a lot to think about. Yeah, tell me. Oh, because this is what they did. You know, we, they, they can't see the word, the purity of the word of God because of all these things they added to it. That's not only the Pharisees, by the way. Uh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeshua explains this very well. Look at verse 6 to 8. Now it's getting easier, beautiful. Okay? Uh, Because I want to tell you that the Mosaic law stands as a principle of love. Love towards God, okay, and your neighbor. Okay? This is what the Mosaic law stands for in there. He said, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. He's talking about himself. But if you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord over the Shabbat. Okay, what he says here, uh, Simon, you mentioned that verse, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, but that comes from the mouth of a high priest. Okay, and this is a revolution where he says, you know what, the temple is nothing. If the heart is not there. This is what Jesus says, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, why? You can make very sacrifice. I mean, your gifts. I don't need your gifts. I want your heart. This is, this is the whole idea over there. Okay? In there. And so, and so you have grace, 
right? You have mercy, you have justice. You know the difference between uh, justice, mercy, grace. This is important when you consider the law. Okay, when it comes to justice, the justice condemns. When the police stops you, you have to pay your ticket. Okay, so you do something wrong. Mercy removes the condemnation. And grace gives us salvation. Covers it. Okay, yeah. Then even Moses understood the lawgiver. Do you know that for 40 years he didn't sac- he didn't circumcise any of the Jews? That was the law. He said no, and yet he knew because he spoke of the circumcision of the heart. Okay, they, 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 you know he had they had a, a, a very broad understanding. Okay, and this is what I want to bring you again to verse four and five, where twice Jesus, have you not read? Have you not read? Because he's not only speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to us as well. Okay, when we are stuck somewhere with certain problems. Okay, read and you're going to see. I I say to the people, even read the kings of Israel. You're going to see, you're going to find yourself sitting with that king. Okay, it's about the the situation is the same. So so this tells us that from these uh, these religious leaders, okay, when Jesus came, they were already set up. A new religion was already set up. Okay, and this... When he says that, he brings out, he reflects what the prophet said. Who said, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge? Who said that? Uh, Hosea 4.6. Hosea, Hosea. And you know what? I have to say, it's happening today as well. Okay. This is why we, we, we're trying to be on the radio, left and right, to try to bring out this word. Okay. Who said, my people have gone into the diaspora because they have no knowledge? Isaiah 5.13. Okay, you wonder why the Jews... Uh, do you have another one like this for everybody? <laughs> <laughs> All right. By the way, do you know about the... Th- I mean, let me tell you, because as we're going to get in into Matthew, we're going to meet the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. You know about these three uh, sects? The Sadducees were the priests. Okay, so what happened? How did they come? Sadducees, uh, the book of Ezra, when they, they came from Babylon, they didn't know how to, uh, how to speak Hebrew anymore, so this is why the priest came to translate for them. Uh, and they, they, this is why they have the Targums. The Targums are translation from the Hebrew into Aramaic. Okay, however, they were the ones who held the word of God and they became like very stiff. Okay, they were the ones who had the word of God, so they didn't, uh, let, let's say, they didn't consider the others as very low. So out of this population another group arose Okay, from other tribes. These are the Pharisees. Okay, the Pharisees, and, but they became like them too. And well, the third group is the uh, Herodians or the Essenes, which are beliefs are the same. Okay, so these believe that they were the ones that the, the priests will come from them. They were in the Dead Sea. They were living over there. They were actually separated from all of them, right? But they're called also the Herodian. You know why they're called Herodians? Because one Essene actually gave a prophecy to Herod when he was young, and he says, one day you're going to be a king. And so when he grew up, he says, you are my people. And so he was followed. So they were protected by, by him. Otherwise, because they were a very small group uh, in there, right? We oui. Listen, we're talking about Pharisees, Sadducees. Think about religion today. Think about another denomination. They became God. This is what it is. These guys became God. Okay, so, so, so in the same level, so once you, you start to take the place of God, you become God. Yeah. Two things don't change, okay, from the last 6,000 years. First, the heart of man. Second, the heart of God. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Two things. You can read the Bible anywhere, you're going to find these two problems, okay? So it, it, time matters not in there, okay? Yeah is to bring to bring the people to realize their sinfulness and they go to the righteousness of God. That was the whole idea. The whole idea of sacrifices, every day people are lined up with their, with their animals, there was rivers of blood. Okay, the reason is that God said, I don't want to see you back. That means don't sin anymore. It will be righteousness when we do the law of God, try to do it. In fact, we should all try to do the Mosaic law for a month. Then you got to run to God and say, thank you for Jesus, because I can do it. Okay, that, that's what it is. Okay, and maybe we should go also to uh, an abattoir. How do you say an abattoir? Uh, house. And each one take a cow and kill it yourself. Take out the... Now, hold on, let me finish. You take out the, everything inside yourself. This is what God required. 
in Leviticus so that you understand sin. This is the whole idea of the law. Okay, so people were just doing it at some point, it became like a routine, so to speak. Okay, that's the idea of the law. Then they will see the righteousness of Christ and ask for this righteousness on them. That's the whole idea of the law. Again, it was added. Understanding to these people when they start getting in there. Okay, now let's go and see now then another example of legalism versus love. Okay, and let's not say how bad they are because we're there too. Okay, look at verse 9 and 10. 9 and 10. Now, when he, Yeshua, had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful? Is it lawful to heal on the Shabbat that they might accuse him? Okay. So see how cruel and grim the situation is. They saw a man with a withered hand, and they used them to tempt God, to tempt Jesus, right? Asking him, is it lawful for you to do that? They wanted to catch him, right? Okay. And here Yeshua rephrased their question uh, by, by, and, and brings them back to order. Look at verse 12. He said, is it lawful, you're asking me, is it lawful to do good on the Shabbat? Huh? For this is the question. This is the actual question. After this, Jesus heals the man. And right away. Okay. But instead of rejoicing with him, in verse 14, what do they say? Let's kill him now. Okay. Because at this point, it mattered not that this man, that, that Jesus could make a, uh, a great, uh, that is, miracle. Just like that, right? They wanted to kill him because he didn't go with their own uh, teaching okay he was a threat to the religious establishment when in fact the religious establishment was a threat to the survival of the Jewish people so to speak yeah at this point in verse 15 where we, we see a miracle Jesus withdrew from there then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him right and then Jesus withdrew from them. Okay, he left. He did not allow their scheme to come about. You know that they could have killed him so many times. Okay, and you, Jesus used great miracles in order to move out of there. Uh, for instance, uh, at some point he was in the temple. Okay, in John chapter ten, and therefore they all came to seize him. It says John ten thirty nine, he disappeared. Okay, that's a miracle. Why did he do this miracle? So he can die on the cross for us. That's the beauty of it. Okay, that's the beauty. Imagine, even that they were looking for him and then maybe they forgot. Okay, so it is at this point that the Spirit inspired Matthew to cite an important passage from Isaiah, another great prophet. Okay, look at verse 17 to 21. Maybe somebody would like to read it. Isaiah here. Okay, uh, it's because Isaiah 42 is part of a very great prophecy of the life of the Messiah that we find between chapter 40 to 53 of Isaiah. It's called the Servant Song. Okay, it's beautiful. Chapter 53, this is the last chapter where he dies and resurrects. Chapter 40, you see his life. It's all in there. Yeah. How it begins, both in Isaiah 42, 1 and Matthew 12, 18, uh, we, we see how the whole Trinity actually is engaged in the salvation of men always right behold my servant whom I have chosen my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased I will put my spirit in him right here God the father is speaking okay calling the son my servant my beloved and then you have the spirit as well okay in Isaiah especially in this part of Isaiah you'll see that the whole of the Trinity is engaged with the salvation okay and so we have the father the son and the spirit just like it was at the baptism Remember, they all came, the three of them, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I am. I am so pleased Jesus was as the father and the spirit came upon him. Okay. And notice the mention of Gentiles twice in chapter, in verse 18 and 21, actually. This is the, 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 the role uh, or the raison d'etre, if you want, of Israel. It was there because as I, as I was teaching, for example, uh, last week, you know, we're talking about the, the, the prophets being, uh, that is, 
prophets to the Gentiles as well. Okay, and they were asking, you know, I mean, they, they were have prophecies for the Gentiles. But I said, of course, and they were crying for the Gentiles. Isaiah was crying for Moab, yet they were actually enemies of Israel. Because I told them that the, the reason why Israel was chosen was on, on behalf of the Gentiles. This is where it was created, so that the Gentiles will be blessed. Okay, that, that's the idea. So let's go now to the other incident in Matthew 12, which leads us right to the final rejection and a deeper exposition of the two parallel kingdoms. Two parallel kingdoms. Look at verse 22 only. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him. And the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Okay, this, this one is one of the worst conditions that a man can attain, so to speak. Blind, mute, and the word for mute is translated as elsewhere in the Gospel of Mark as deaf. Okay, so you have a blind, a mute, and a deaf person. Whatever you say, whatever you do has no effect at all. Okay, this man is shut out from reality, so to speak. That's the condition of sin, by the way. This is what sin will do. In a way, this is how we were before uh, the, the, the Messiah came. Okay? But Yeshua heals him. And this was, I want to tell you, an extraordinary uh, miracle that was never done in Israel. How do we know that? Okay, look at verse 23, what the people said. Could this be the son of David? Okay? Could this be the Messiah? Okay, this is what they ask. They knew it was a special miracle, however, and sadly so many of them did not have the courage to affirm it. And so they asked because the Pharisees were watching. They were, right away, they knew that something like this never happened in Israel. And so they said, this is a messianic miracle. But they were afraid because the religious leaders were watching. Okay, you know how many there were in Israel, the religious leaders? About 6,000 of them. And that the power, you don't need many people to have that power against, maybe there were 3 million Jews at that time, okay? It, it takes courage to follow a, minor, uh, a minority. And by the way, good, good for all of you, because you follow the minority. Because it's easy to follow the majority. It's the easy way, like the water that falls down, okay? To follow a, a minority, that is a minority, takes a lot of faith, okay? If you remember, because... Well, even when Jesus healed the man born blind, the parents couldn't say anything. Because at that time, and I believe at this time already, they, they already decreed that whoever believed in Jesus will be excommunicated from the, the, the people of Israel. Okay? So already it is completely separated. This is when we reach a climax. Okay? When the authorities had, no, had to take actually a decision. Okay, here's the man. He makes a great uh, a miracle. What decision did they make? Look at verse 24. Maybe one of the saddest verses you have in the scriptures. This fellow, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebul's, the rulers of demons. Okay, you cannot go, I want to tell you, lower than this. This is the end. When people actually accuse Jesus of being or working for the devil. Okay. By this answer, these authorities proved to be in a worse condition than the blind man. They were. Okay, because they did not see. Okay, Beelzebul is another name for Satan. Okay. Well, what they were saying is that Jesus was performing his miracles by the power of Satan. Now, I don't know where this is going, by the way, because when you speak about the religious leaders, I don't want to put them all down, because many of these people accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Again, the term Pharisee is not that bad of a term. Okay, because even... Paul, he says, he says, I am a Pharisee. He didn't say, I was a Pharisee. The word, we are all Pharisees. You know why? Because the term Pharisee means separated, sanctified. Are you uh, not all sanctified? Okay, in that sense. Okay. So, but many of them, those a minority, maybe I would, I would love to hope, because let's not forget also that in the church, you had the group, the, the, the group of Pharisees, the Christian Pharisees, so to speak. They were there. Okay, it took time, but they were in the book of Acts. So they came with all their luggage of the law and stuff like this. It was difficult at the beginning, but they understood. And Paul was saying they're making progress. Okay. Sure. And that, that the sect of the Pharisees and, and so on. And so were we too, so to speak. Now, uh, now look at verse 25 to 28. 
And, and this is, the, look at the gentleness of Jesus, because he's going to defend himself. He doesn't need to defend himself. This is the creator, right? He says, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out demons, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Right? Notice the stress on the word kingdom mentioned three times here, okay? In the, in the argument of, of Yeshua. First, he reminds them that if the works of Satan, this, if this is the work of Satan, then Satan's kingdom is divided. However, he just entered it and subdued it. This is what Jesus there said. He says, I'm not part of them, right? Second, he reminds them that if he could do this, it's because the kingdom of God has come. You know that. I did this miracle. You yourself ask if I was the Messiah. Yes, I am the Messiah, he says to them, right? This is where we clearly learn of the existence again of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, both on earth existing side by side even today, okay? This is a reality again we tend to close our eyes on, okay? Because again, you know, with, when somebody is nice, you know, we think they're going to heaven, whatever, and so on, you know, we need to pray for them, okay? Uh, let's go a little, a little further. Oui, dis-moi. Then actually in him. Okay. Yeshua entered his kingdom and he actually, this is what he did. He took the strong man and he uh, tied him up. For us, we are to realize, to know the existence of evil and to fight it as Ephesians 6, okay, uh, you know, by the power of his might. Okay. And remember again, Ephesians 6, 10, I believe it says, put on the armor of God. That means you don't have it on, you're not born with it. It's not natural. When you wake up in the morning, you have to put on that armor. What is the armor of God? Prayer. Yeah? Yeah, many other things. And he's here with, uh, with verses 30 to 32. And we have another five minutes when we really uh, are entering a new section, really, of the book of Matthew. One which teaches us that there is a point, an edge, a set time where the, the, where the Lord needs to, to just go. Okay? You know, God is very patient. Okay? At some point, He goes. Okay? When we persist in sin. I'm talking about you if you're a believer. Okay? He's always going to be in you. He'll never leave you. never lose your salvation. When it comes to the world, at some point, He's going to have to go because He cannot tolerate the, the, the things. Okay? In Hosea, after repeated pleas okay, of imploration, he, he yielded and said, Ephraim is joined to idol, leave him alone. Okay, Hosea 4.17. That, that, that verse weighs so much. Leave him alone, God. You've got to leave Ephraim alone. This is when Ephraim folded, really. Okay. So this is what Jesus is about to say here. You know, leave him alone. So this we leave them alone. I'm going somewhere else. Okay. Uh, what is this? Look at verse 30 to 32. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I said to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Spirit of God, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Wow, this is one of the heaviest verses here. Okay, what is the sin against the Holy Spirit? Just let me start by telling you that you cannot commit the sin of the Holy Spirit if you accepted the Lord Yeshua. Okay, so don't, just leave it. It's not for you. But what is it for the others? Yes, yeah. define it. Other than that, <clears throat> what, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? What, what, does, <clears throat> what does the Holy Spirit convict you of sin? Okay. The sin against the Holy Spirit, it comes a time when you have refused all attempt of the Spirit to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. The Son of Man, yes, he came to be mistreated. He says, fine, you can insult me. In fact, you did already, and you killed me, right? But the Holy Spirit, and we find this in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 8, 9. Maybe you can turn there, because this is the work of the Spirit in unbelievers and in believers as well, too. John 16, 8 and 9. 
And when he has come, that is the Spirit of God, he will convict the world of three things, okay? Of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. So that they may understand. And this is a miracle, I believe, that is happening in every single person. I, I'm 100% believe this, okay? Every single person will have this, okay? What the Spirit does. And not only that, I think he does that with us as well. Because when we go astray, okay, we, we need to be convicted of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment as well. But those who came, and don't forget, he spoke to Pharisees who actually had the word of God in their hands. They came so close, and he says to them, you know, it's too late now. You came too far to come to insult God in the way you did. Okay, this is where he removes himself, yeah. If you go, let's say, to the nation of Israel at that time, because the consequence of, the, of refusing the Holy Spirit was the destruction of Jerusalem and of uh, Israel and the t- temple. It was from that time on in 70 AD that Israel was called Palestinian. Okay, up to today. Okay, this because the religious leaders, not the people, because the people, even when Jesus came into Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna, he's the son of David. But this is where a minority of very strong, hard headed religious people can do, okay, to destroy your whole nation. For them, that was actually the consequence of against the Holy Spirit, but we cannot apply it to, yeah. Uses all attempt of the Holy Spirit to come to a saving knowledge. It's not up to us to know or to decide, except that believe that supposed believer insults Jesus the way they did insult, and saying that what he did is under is under Satan. Then we know to move back from that person. We know that there's nothing. This is what Hebrews six four says. They cannot come back at some point because they, they saw the movie already. What you go see a movie second time? That's yeah. yeah. We went at the Sermon on the Mount. We all just went like everybody was flying. Okay. But, but this, okay, it requires us to understand what's happening in order to really appreciate. And again, look at Yeshua. He's very nice. He's, you know, this is who you want to follow. And you see the opposition. Okay. How they're against him.